Let me uh, start by um, uh, the disclosure statement. I have no conflict of interest to be reported. Um, and then um, show a picture of my country. Uh, this is uh, the Netherlands. And I used to kind of joke a little bit that when I show this in the United States, I usually have to explain that the Netherlands is not the capital of Denmark. Uh, <laughs> but, but here we go. Uh, we have uh, eight medical schools. Uh, right in the center is Utrecht. Uh, this is where I work, uh, medical school. And if you zoom in a little bit from above, this is part of the campus of Utrecht University and actually showing the University Medical Center. And in the circle is our education building. I always like to show our education building for those who have not ever visited. There's one of you who have visited us and knows this building, right, Nick? Um, but if you look at it uh, at dusk or dawn, I'm not sure when this picture was taken. It's like an x-ray uh, of the, our education building. And the architect was charged to with building uh, a, a building that was to be used for training medical students and biomedical scientists. And as you can see, if you really look carefully to the building, you can see there's three lungs extending th through glass columns through the building. And in the bottom, you can see uh, the cardiovascular system, the red part. And if you look into the building, you can see the aorta uh, running up and down the building here. <laughs> So uh, this is what the building look like, looks like. And uh, now my question for you is, how would you rate the architect? How would you, how would you rate the architect? There's no answer? So let, let me give you a little, yeah, I'll, let me help you a little here. Okay. Yeah, that, that, this, this will help you, right? So fail below expectations or meet expectations, exceed expectations, still difficult, right? So wh 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 why is it so difficult? Of course, we need criteria. So here, here's some criteria. We could look at expertise, communication, collaboration, management, leadership, advocacy, professionalism, scholarship. Could, were, had this architect passed their engineering and, and design exams, passed communication exams, colleagues and assistants report adequate collaboration, uh, their team members are satisfied, it's incorporated uh, medical education purpose in this building, so that should, could be some sort of advocacy. Professionalism, maybe this architect is a little bit egotistic. Um, scholarship, well, the constructions uh, used up-to-date knowledge. But then the question is, would you choose this architect, would you trust this architect to build your next building? So would you, would you know that? How would you know that? So let's go back to healthcare. What is the idea, what is the origin of the idea of EPAs? Now the short, the short answer was actually a, a very brief conversation that I had with my CEO from University Medical Center. Um, and <clears throat> that was about 12 years ago. At that time, I was an advisor of the Central College of Medical Specialties in the Netherlands. And I had, I had just convinced them to introduce the CanMeds model to import it from Canada and they were about to uh, roll this out uh, in the Netherlands, competency-based medical education according to that framework. And then that CEO in this five minute brief conversation with me said, uh, this really resembles what the, what the nurses have done 10 years ago. They started uh, to train nurses in their nursing schools instead of in the workplace. And now they really have developed an elaborate competency-based framework for their training. Um, and they're really uh, competent when they, have, when on paper, they're very competent when they leave school. And then they come into the workplace. And the only thing is uh, they cannot calculate the drips of the IV anymore. Um, and there's other things that they can't do, really. And then I thought, we'll have to be careful when we introduce this for medical specialties in the Netherlands, a competency-based framework, that we don't lose connection with the workplace. So that was actually one, the, the short answer. The long answer starts with this. Uh, it goes about 120,000 years ago. I actually stole this, de this slide, or the, the idea of the slide from your, your country fellow, man, um, Stephen Billet from Brisbane. Um, and I've seen a few of his presentations where he has a ruler with him. He always shows the ruler on stage and would say, um, we have to remember that uh, 
only a very, very tiny part of our human history, we have used schools to educate people. Um, and most of the time, people have learned the things that, the trades in the workplace. Uh, and we had very elaborate <laughs> cultures, like in, he'd like to show about the Chinese cultures, where people learned a lot in the workplace on a very high sophisticated level. And they didn't have uh, regular schools like, like we had. People learned things in the workplace. And there's different types of workplaces that people were, would be trained in, um, and uh, also uh, in, in medicine, of course. Uh, and by the end of the, the uh, about a century ago, this was uh, how surgeons were, uh, were, were evaluated, actually, after working in the workplace. Uh, this, these are the exams of the Royal College of Surgery in London. Um, and here's where you see, start seeing that there's some disconnect between how people are evaluated and what they learn in the workplace. So basically, what happened in the 20th century? What have we gained in the 20th century in our sophistication of education? Or have we also lost things? And what are we trying to regain? Now, one of the most important uh, persons for medical education in the 20th century um, issued was uh, uh, um, actually completed a report uh, in, in 1910 on the uh, quality of medical education in the United States. Um, and what Abraham Flexner actually, um, actually caused with his, his, um, with his report was a huge overturn of the, the type of edu medical education that we had, not only in the United States, but also across the world, uh, definitely also in Europe. What his paradigm shift at that time was, he said, we have practice-based, uh, we have been using practice-based knowledge, but we actually should use knowledge-based practice. Why don't we start with a scientific rigor uh, before people ever go to, to, uh, to the workplace in, in medical schooling? So what have we gained, uh, partly based on what um, Abraham Flexen actually suggested, and uh, he, has, he had huge influence in the United States. Many schools were closed down because of this. Uh, they didn't meet the standards that he had proposed in his report. So now we have scientific rigor and knowledge, uh, uh, both about medicine and about education. We have more structured curricula. We have sophisticated teaching methods. There's m much medical technology and health care that we use. There's specialized expertise. We have high quality of care. But maybe some people would wonder, do we have that at a cost? Do it, have we lost things, too? Have, are, we, are we at a risk of losing the connection between the science and, and the care? Um, are patients still our continued focus of, of care and education? Are university medical centers still the most suitable workplaces to train medical students? How about the longitudinal and personal coaching and supervision that we probably had for ages and we are tending to lose now. So people are sometimes worried that we are, are losing the art of healing. Or, and so what do we struggle to regain? So the concept of medical competence has been something that at least the Canadians in the 1990s, but all, I think other places of the world too, um, has been rethought. Uh, the general competencies of the physicians have been redefined and the integration with education is something also that we would like to uh, regain somewhat. There is also a recent report by the Carnegie Foundation um, a few years ago that had four basic big recommendations and that Carnegie report was actually issued because it was 100 years after the first Carnegie report written by Abram Flexner. So it actually, it's the second Flexner report. And that report really says one of the things they recommend is have a better integration with, uh, with teaching and health care. Um, so it also, and the continuity of teaching and coaching and care might be better. And then we'd have to think about what, what actually is medical competence. And many people are uh, thinking and writing about that in the past decades. One of the things, of course, that has uh, has resulted in that is competency-based medical education. 
The philosophy of competency-based medical education, I think everybody would agree with that. Um, that is a better description of the positions. We now include many qualities that were not explicitly include, included in, in the concept of comp medical competence, I would say, 30 years ago. So that better description is not the only thing. Uh, the other thing is that we, in competency-based medical education, we like to make a promise uh, to only graduate physicians that meet standards. And if you do that, basically, we'd have to realize that individuals are different and contexts are different, and we should not have the time period as the, the most important criterion to graduate uh, medical um, graduates. And, but we should actually look at their competence. And when we feel that they are ready to graduate, we should graduate them, not earlier and not later. Um, so that actually implies uh, shifting from a time-based philosophy to a competency-based philosophy. And in practice, we've been doing that. Um, we have been uh, trying to do that, let, let me say it that way. So what we, uh, what we can see that there's elaborate competency descriptions that have been uh, issued. The Canadian one is one example. The United States have a different competency frameworks so of the ACGME, also detailed. So there's a detailed description of competency. And what we found in the past 20 years that not everybody found that easy to implement. Uh, so teaching and assessment uh, have became sub somewhat of a struggle using these frameworks. And if you read the literature over the past 15 years, you would even see very critical uh, authors writing papers uh, like I'm issuing the, uh, the idea of, of the tyranny of competency or the incapacitating effects or monkey see, monkey do. Um, and these, uh, these critics, the, the question is, what is actually their problem? Uh, do they really have a point? And I think the causes of that controversy about competency-based medical education is for many people not so much the principle. They, they, pe people like that principle, but rather it is the implementation. How do you implement that? How, how do you make that work? For some people, however, it is also more of a philosophical, um, fundamentally different view on educating physicians. Now, one view is actually the, the analytic approach that we have been using with competency-based education. If we think of a physician, it is too broad to evaluate. You'd have to break that up in roles uh, or domains of competence. Now, these are the well-known roles from the, the Canadian ChemMets model. And if you think of it, if you would evaluate individuals on uh, communication, for instance, you would uh, have to actually look more deeply into communication because it, there's different ways of communicating. There is, and communicating with, with nurses and colleagues is different than with patients and different um, than with trainees. But if, even if you look at communication with patients, there's many types of communication with patients and you would actually like to evaluate all those qualities of the physician. Now, if you see that uh, this analytic approach um, come to life, you'd, you'd really see this complete document of competencies and, and sub-competencies very detailed. Um, this analytic approach led to the recent version of that report with 161 key competencies, 28 um, or uh, key concepts and 28 key competencies, 116 enabling competencies and even over 400 milestones that have been recently added. And it's I think it's, it's a terrific document. It's a very elaborate description. Many of these things you would not disagree with, actually. But the only thing is, if you really want to use that framework that way and evaluate uh, all these individuals on all these competencies, um, by, so one thing is you would not be able to remember that nobody actually knows that. And you'd all have to refer every time to that elaborate document. But if you have really ticked that all off, all those things, Will you still be able to trust your learner to actually do the work in healthcare if you just look at those detailed competencies? So basically, there is the two fundamental views, if, or those people who would not fundamentally 
agree with a competency-based approach, well, they would say that you could actually say um, either doctors are defined by a set of competencies, and if you can describe them well in such an elaborate document as the KenMeds, and if we can identify, train, and monitor all those required behaviors, um, we suggest to guarantee good doctors. That's the analytic view. The other view is actually uh, becoming the doctor requires stimulation of identity formation and internalization of, of values over time. And that has been um, described by Brian Hodges as the, the tea steeping metaphor. But here you have a glass of water, that's the workplace, hot water. Here's the learner, which is the tea bag. Just put the tea bag in the water and just wait. Don't do anything. Just wait until about, about four minutes you take it off and here you have the tea. Um, and what they say is much of that development cannot be regulated by all sorts of frameworks. But as you, if you, if, if you a slightly different analogy that has the same thing is, if we educate doctors, are we building a house with bricks? Can we really define all those competencies and build a house? Or should we nurture a plan for autonomous growth? Actually, both sides have their drawbacks. So the over-control and external regulation that comes with those detailed frameworks also conveys some sort of distrust in the autonomous growth of individuals. External uh, control does not always stimulate that intrinsic motivation that you would like to stimulate in, in learners. But also, letting the, just the tea steep or the plant grow conveys some over-reliance on natural happenings and with no control of quality. And we cannot accept that either. We need to make sure that there is safe patient care at the end of the day. So we probably must reconcile these bricks and branches and uh, maybe we should go back to our fundamental questions first. So what is the work that must be done is our first question. What, is the, what are we training people for? What, what is the type of work that hap happens every day? And when can we start our learners to do that work? How do we prepare them for unsupervised practice? How do we evaluate their readiness for it? And then maybe how many, what type of competencies do we actually need for learners to be able to do that? Maybe we should regain a little bit of the features of the 120,000 years of workplace learning and combine that with 21st century doctors. Here we get to untrustable professional activities. They are defined as a unit of professional practice that may be entrusted to a learner to uh, execute unsupervised once she, he or she has demonstrated the, the required competence for that activity. So untrustable professional activities are executable within a time frame. Um, they are observable and measurable. measurable. They are task allocated to individuals and suitable for entrustment decisions. And when you want to identify EPAs, you just think of your practice on Monday morning, um, 8 o'clock. I was talking to the surgeons yesterday. I said Monday morning, 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, just think of what happens during the whole day, uh, then during the whole week until Sunday evening, uh, and just identify what are those tasks that must be done by someone and you're looking for learners or professionals that can do that. To break up the words, entrustable professional activities, really, if you want to define them or identify them, they must be entrustable. So it's all about acts that require trust by colleagues or patients or society. They are professional. Those are, uh, EPAs are only those tasks that are truly professional, confined to occupations with some extraordinary qualification and right that other people would not be permitted to do. And then it's all on activities, so the task that must be done. And if you use that, EPAs can ground competencies in daily practice. So again, uh, to elaborate on the differences between competencies and EPAs, competencies are really the descriptors of a person. So a person could be competent, could be, have knowledge, could have skills, attitudes, and values, and habits, and those are all qualities of the person. Now here's the work that must be done. 
So the work is something that is independent of, of individuals. It, it's just work that must be done. And you're looking for an individual who actually has the profile or the competencies to be able to do that work. And so you're, you're hiring or you're looking for a person. You could look at your learners. There's something that must be done, and you pick the learner who can do that best. So it's actually like a jigsaw puzzle. So there's tasks that must be done, and you're looking at um, the individuals who have the profile, who have been trained, who have, been, have the experiences to be able to do that. So again, if you think of EPAs and competencies, so competencies are, and EPAs are actually two dimensions of looking at your program and at, at your educational program. And you have to realize that EPAs almost always draw on many more than one competency. It's always the integration of competencies. And if you think of just history taking, very simple example. So history taking requires that people communicate well with patients. But of course, it requires that they have uh, expert knowledge to be able to ask the next question. They have their diagnostic reasoning. They have their hypothesis driven uh, questioning that they must be able to do. So there's no way that you could separate the communication skill from clinical reasoning and expertise. So uh, my proposal actually with using EPAs is to fully focus assessment on the EPAs, not specifically on individual competencies, because that is very theoretical. Um, so why don't we why don't we map out our program and say, these are the things that really must be done. And of course, they require uh, several different competencies. And you can all take those competencies into account. But the real focus of the assessment is the APA. And if you have mapped that out right in, in your program, why not just assume that if people can do all those EPAs, and you could actually really trust them to do those EPAs unsupervised, you can actually assume that they have the competencies to be able to do that. And in that way, actually, EPAs are more, not so much analytic, rather a, a synthetic approach. And in, in those EPAs, all those competencies come together. And you may be able to discern them when you evaluate learners. But basically, the focus of the assessment is the EPA. Now, I've been talking about unsupervised practice as, as that's what you would want to evaluate persons for. Can you trust them to do this EPA unsupervised? Um, so that could be defined as what competence actually means. So competence is reached then when that professional activity is mastered at the threshold level that permits to trust this person to work unsupervised. And in that sense, um, competent is actually a stage in the development that goes on even after have you have uh, established that trust to work unsupervised, as learners may keep on developing um, even until they retire, uh, for instance. So competence growth over time could look like this graph. And if you uh, put a framework on that graph of stages of development, uh, could look like this. This is a well-known uh, framework that has been used by psychologists in the United States. Starts with the lowest level would be novice level. The second level would be the advanced beginner level. The third level has, by Dreyfus and Dreyfus, been called competent. The fourth level would be proficient. And the fifth level would be expert. Now, if we use that framework, we could actually say, why don't we use that word competent as that threshold level that, that permits us to have that learner work unsupervised. Uh, and actually, that, here's where you define that stage of training. And here you can actually um, uh, make a decision uh, that this, this person is, is permitted to do that, to work unsupervised. Now, if you think of, uh, of this graph as one APA, um, there could also be uh, a different task that would be easier. Uh, so at, a, at an earlier stage, people have a higher level of competence to do this EPA. Uh, there could be some uh, task that doesn't even happen in the first year of training, 
you would only be asked to st start doing that in second year of training. And uh, here is even an, an easier one. Here is one that you uh, have actually, in, a, in one individual, uh, know that this person has a lot of experience even before training. Uh, as you have your prov uh, so pre-vocational period, uh, that would, would be very, very likely to happen. Um, and if you draw that same line of competence, you can actually see that there's different moments in training where it would be actually be logical to, ha to, to be able to take that decision that you would really would trust that person to work unsupervised. So there's different moments of justified entrustment decisions. Now if you take these graphs as a representation of one individual, one trainee, there could be another trainee with different um, background knowledge when they start, different circumstances, different attitude to learning, and you could have different graphs and different moments that you would actually uh, be able to take that justified entrustment decision um, about different EPAs. There could even be an EPA that people is, are, are trusted to do unsupervised, but they will, if they never practice that afterwards, there might be a moment that you would actually lose that trust in that person, and actually they should fall back uh, behind that, th below that threshold level. But basically, if you look at this way, uh, the, EPA, the APA approach can serve that flexibility that competency-based medical education actually uh, requires, because you acknowledge there is intra-trainee variation for different EPAs, and there is inter-trainee variation between individuals. They're not all the same. And there's also context variation. You could have the same person being trained in different contexts that would have different experiences at different moments. They would actually reach that threshold level for different EPAs. So basically what we're saying is you should um, individualize training more uh, because one size does not fit all trainees. Now I talked about this threshold level of unsupervised practice, which is very logical to use for any postgraduate specialty training, because that's where you're heading for. But if you uh, more closely evaluate or monitor over time the uh, trainees, you could distinguish uh, more detailed levels of supervision, um, reflecting an increasing trust in the trainee's autonomy. So we start with level uh, one that would represent um, the situation that the person is permitted to be present but not allowed to enact the EPA. The second level would be to practice the EPA with direct supervision. The supervisor must be in the room, um, can actually take over when the supervisor determines this is a moment that I should offer help for this learner. Uh, the third level would be that the, the individual would uh, be allowed to work without the supervisor in the room and uh, the supervisor would rely on providing or, or, the, or a request for help and then be quickly available, which is, we, we call that reactive supervision. And then that level four really represents the level that you would expect uh, for graduates to have reached before they start independent practice. Uh, that is a threshold level for uh, unsupervised practice. And of course, within a training period, if you do that for an EPA before the full training is over, uh, you could um, just rely on that distant oversight, but still convey that idea of we trust you to work as our colleague, like we would trust you when you were um, registered as a, as, a, as a specialist here. And level five uh, is also possible that would be the level that you would ask um, a trainee to supervise junior learners. Now, if we think of EPAs and competencies um, and supervision, you can s kind of see how that framework should work. And uh, something new is milestones. And I usually, the people in the United States have been working with milestones for a number of years, all required for postgraduate training. Recently, the Canadians have also um, design their frame with, with milestones and how those, how do those uh, concepts all come together? Um, 
there's one way of thinking uh, in that direction. Now, if you think of this is the United States approach to competencies, uh, they have a framework that looks a little slightly different. They have six, not seven domains of competence. Uh, they look like this, and their milestones are all written to the sub-competencies within those domains of competence. They're all published in the journal Graduate Medical Education for anyone who would be interested to see them. They all have been defined in five stages of development. Those milestones are really descriptors of, of behavior. What type of behavior would you expect to see when, uh, when individuals for a, sp a specific competence, competency uh, are at level one or two or three or four or five. Now, uh, it's kind of a coincidence that our supervision levels are also five levels. And what ACG actually says that at level four, that would, that would usually be the level that you would expect the people have to at, at the end of training, at the graduation. So that also complies with our fourth level of supervision. So you actually could you could put on top of this the idea of EPAs. Now this is an EPA. You could say this EPA, uh, it's taken from an example from pediatrics, but um, to provide telephone advice and management of patient, it draws mostly on three of those um, six domains of competence. And if you look at those uh, milestones and you put the supervision levels on top of it, it could look like this. So if, if people, if, if the individual should would show the behavior that complies with level three milestones. Um, you could say they are, uh, for this EPA, ready for indirect supervision. So they can do it by themselves. Uh, they can have help if they need it, but th if they don't need help, they can just finish this EPA by themselves. So to, um, to summarize somewhat in between now, so. EPAs may change your view of competency-based training and practice in several ways. So one is the curriculum. They, the EPAs can be building blocks for individual curriculum uh, for individuals, and they can provide clear targets for learners, but also a clear framework for, for clinicians and supervisors. It may change your, your view on uh, assessment as we use entrustment decisions rather than as, um, providing us a skill of, of, of competence. Um, it, it would lead to legitimate peripheral participation of trainees gradually going into the profession rather than overnight at the moment of registration. And EPAs could also um, be helpful uh, when we think of maintenance of certification, maintenance of competence. So I'll just briefly say something about those four things. Here's an example of, of a curriculum. Here's an uh, individualized workplace curriculum of, of trainee Jones. Uh, could be uh, part of their portfolio to look at it this way. And the colors represent those levels of supervision. And level four really is that level uh, that people would be considered to have reached that threshold level that is that reflects graduation level uh, that they would be allowed to work unsupervised. It could be at different moments. And if they proceed, they would, could be asked to be supervising more junior learners. So that's the curriculum. So if you think of uh, entrustment decisions, uh, entrustment decisions is a way of assessment that is more than the traditional workplace assessment. So trusting a trainee is also, if you think of it, if you trust a person to do things, it's taking a risk and that risk must be manageable or acceptable uh, because you become vulnerable. Uh, if it's a uh, risk that you take that people will uh, attend your patients, you will be vulnerable too. But basically, if you think of entrustment decision, it's more um, than just evaluating the ability. It's also providing the permission to do things, give them the right to act. Uh, and also, you can schedule them to do, them, to do things, so it's also uh, the combination with the duty to act. Now, if you think of the traditional workplace assessment, um, you, you recognize these types of conversations. Here's a learner uh, who must be evaluated, and the learner really hopes to be marked as superior, 
And as a supervisor, in, you're, very often your thinking is, why, uh, uh, how, how should I come to an assessment? This person, uh, she, she's nice and she works hard and it won't hurt her and will, will probably stimulate her if I do mark her as superior. Now if you think of that, uh, that type of assessment, uh, we must realize that's difficult to do. There's many issues that challenge the validity of workplace assessments. We know that. There's, there's problems of content specificity. So you've observed a person do one type of patients, but, and they do pretty well, but that doesn't really predict how well they do it with another patient. We have context specificity. There's context variation. There's expert judgment that varies too. There's a radar bias even in, within one person. Uh, we know the problems of halo effects in assessment. You've seen a very small, small part of, a, of, of an individual and you actually make conclusions about a much broader um, view of, of their competence. There's, there's a well-known leniency bias that we usually score too, too highly uh, for learners. Uh, there is a restriction of range, there is a lack of a, of a reference frame where people have very often not a very clear picture how to a benchmark in their mind to be able to evaluate well. There is a low construct alignment of rating instruments. And observations, we should realize that not always can be turned in numbers. Uh, and that's a concept that is difficult to understand for, for many, specifically the more the regulator persons, they would say, well, can't you just value, can't you just score on objective? How can we make that all objective? Now, in healthcare, we're, we have always variations. Every, t every patient is different, and experts have their knowledge, and we need those expertise. Uh, they need that expertise to, to evaluate learners. And uh, so we also have to rely on, on, on the idea that pe not every, Everything that you can observe can be um, turned into numbers. Yeah? Not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that, be, that can be counted uh, counts, uh, is what people think that Einstein said. But I think uh, there's a reference to a certain Cameron who said that. Um, expert judgment is, necessarily, is, is necessary. We need expert judgment. Uh, but experts are not always very easily can express why they feel that way. So there is, experts have sometimes a gut feeling, and you may think of your own learners, sometimes you'd feel this learner is not quite ready to work on supervised. I cannot leave the room yet. Um, and you, it's very difficult sometimes to make that very explicit, even though learners want that, and uh, your examination committee wants that, and you have that feeling, I can't do this, this is my patient, if I have to choose who takes care of my patient, it, I would probably choose someone else. And, and that's a very valid feeling. It's a very valid gut feeling. The only thing that we can do is try to help you to express why you would think that. But it's basically something that we have to accept that individual experts have that quality and we need that quality also. Sometimes is it, it is, I, I know it when I see it. Um, Sometimes if you really have to, are forced to um, explain what the difference is between two images, for instance, and you see the, uh, immediately see the difference, but it's very hard to describe what the difference exactly is. Here's an example. So um, you recognize one of the pictures, so you don't recognize the others, but if you have to describe what the difference is, it's, it's really difficult to do that. So again, entrustment decisions as assessment is recognizing the ability and the right and the duty to act. So if you think of that same conversation and don't think of the traditional workplace assessment, but the, but the EPA-based uh, workplace assessment, there's a little different thinking uh, in the clinician here. She's nice and works hard, but it may hurt my patients if I mark her ready for unsupervised practice. So the evaluation of learners using EPAs suddenly brings the patient into the equation. You're not talking about the learner only, but you're really talking about, I'm really transferring responsibility to this person by taking that decision. So this is the, the, the mindset you would like to have when using EPAs in your program. That is, that is different than the traditional evaluation. So the trust concept in the EPA-based assessment 
um, we should realize that make yourself vulnerable. It's taking the calculated risk that adverse events are manageable. So graduate, graduate will be certified to carry out activities that supervisors have not been able to observe and learners have, may have never encountered. So that's also what we mean with trust. You're trusting someone to do something that you've not been able to observe. We have to accept that. And that is because healthcare is changing all the time. And examination committees or regulators don't like that because they want proof that people can do everything, uh, have, been, have been evaluated on everything they have to do in practice. And we know we can't do that. So that element of trust is important. So what you actually want to require, you want to have a sense of your learners to cope with unexpected situations. Eh? And trustment decisions require an estimation of adaptive competence too. So entrustment, eh, assessment with entrustment in mind means not rating on a scale from one to nine or F to A. Uh, it's not rating on separate <laughs> competencies only. It's thinking of EPAs as whole tasks that integrate all those competencies and think all the time how much supervision is needed here. How much supervision? That's the basic question you have. It's really, can I leave the theater for the procedural specialties? For This is a paper from a study in actually here in New Zealand. Um, and uh, what they found is if you change the terminology from uh, just a regular assessment to how much supervision does this person need, you actually f find a more reliable workplace assessment. So why are there more valid? Because we align the construct of assessment with the construct of patient care uh, in, in a teaching hospital. So, and how much supervision is needed is a kind of logical scale to think of. And clinicians are not forced to think on a scale they do not naturally use in their thinking, which happens very often now in my country too. People have to evaluate a learner on a scale they don't completely understand and say, I'm forced to do this, why don't I just cross this? And I don't really know what I'm doing, but at least we've completed it, I'll, I'll sign that for you and you, you can go on. So we're, we're really trying to get, big, get that very close to what people really feel is important for patient care. So, and that does include some, of, some gut feeling of experts. Um, I know it when I see it, that may weigh in. And EP, EPAs may be related to competencies to help the gut feeling uh, when it says uh, no or slow down. So if you really have the, dis the discourse with the learner said, I don't understand why I'm not allowed to do this, then you can pull up that framework, and you can pull out uh, all those descriptions, and they may help you to explain it to the learner. And that type of assessment is more holistic. The entrustment combines skills and knowledge and attitude and more test features that you're not always able to ex describe explicitly. Now, before we uh, just think of entrustment decision as one thing, it is good to make a distinction between ad hoc entrustment decisions and summative entrustment decisions. Because if you build your curriculum, there must be moments, and the ultimate summative entrustment decision, of course, is the registration with, uh, as a fellow of your, uh, of, your, of your college. But before that, you could actually certify people for, for individual EPAs. And that is a summative entrustment decision here, and usually do that collectively, not just one supervisor, but you do that as a group uh, or uh, responsible. Um, in the United States, they have now mandated that there is competency committees um, and uh, take that decision of summative entrustment decision. Now, before you do that, of course, ad hoc entrustment decisions hap happen all the time. You need that for learners. You just as a supervisor, you evaluate the situation. You think, now, given this situation, this type of patient, this, um, this help around, I know the nurse who is that, this is a very experienced nurse, so I can leave the room now. So I can have my learner do that for the first time. Of course, you'd have to do that. You'd have to practice that. Then evaluate that and say, how did this person do? Did actually the person need help or not? Uh, did, the, did the nurse come in? Did they call me? Uh, so can you evaluate? And if you have some uh, series of those experiences, you can see learners grow. Use that for monitoring. And finally, as an input 
for your summative entrustment decision after a while. Now, we should realize that trusting a person, as I said, is broader than only evaluating ability. And when we look at the literature, people have identified qualities of, of individuals before you can trust those individuals to do things for you, not only in healthcare, but actually more broadly. And what it boils down to really is uh, four elements that really capture most of, of those qualities. Of course, the first is ability. It is competence. Can you really, do you have the knowledge and the skills to do this? But then there are some other things too. And you can summarize them as integrity, as one thing. Integrity really means this person is honest or truthful and, in, and benevolent. And you must make sure that uh, you won't trust a person who is not really honest when they report about any encounter that they have with a patient, for instance. So honesty is, is an integrity in, together is important. Then reliability is important. And with reliability here, we mean actually uh, how conscientious and how consistent are people in their behavior when they actually carry out the activities. If they have very consistent behavior, it's much easier to trust the person to do that because you've seen that happen a few times and then the next time you, you'll probably be, eh, be ready to take that risk. Um, and humility is important. Humility actually is the idea that a, uh, an individual observes their own limitations and are also willing to ask for help if they need help. But those, those qualities are important. And if you give those qualities to any supervisor, they will usually recognize that. So summative entrustment decisions are really the certification of the end of course level to act on supervised, that is in specialty training or in undergraduate education, our medical schools, we say uh, that the end of medical school people should be able to work with indirect supervision only. Um, so it is the recognition of the ability to act, the right and the permission to act and the duty to act and to be scheduled for clinical services. And the, so those summative entrustment decisions should really be signed or, or attested by multiple clinicians who take responsibility. We, it's not something that an individual would only do because that is, is an important, I would almost say milestone, <coughs> but that, that word has been used for different contexts, but it's an important moment uh, in, in, the, uh, in education. Now, if we go and try to, to, to actually make it more practical and think of what, what are EPAs and how do you write them, how do you identify them, there's some misconceptions on, on EPAs too. And uh, from correspondence that I had last year with one of the early adopters who reads a lot of the literature and says, well, myth, EPAs have become a label de jour for virtually everything. Uh, and then if you really think of EPAs, just to remember, um, if you cannot envision a moment, a pivotal moment of mission uh, to act unsupervised for a learner, this is probably not an EPA. And EPAs are also broad units of professional practice. You don't want to take summative entrustment decisions every week for small details, but you want to act broad APAs are units of professional practice that you would say you're allowed to do this now. If we think of, um, of people after training, and, and I ask, I, I regularly talk with anesthesiology people because they are very active in the APAs and the more senior ones would say, well, I, there's part of that profession that I don't practice anymore, and people should not be able to trust me to do that. So here we talk about a unit of professional practice that they don't do anymore, and that's, that's really, really identifiable as an EPA. So EPA should be, uh, not be sometimes, disease. when I look at the literature, I see people list disease and say, well, that's an EPA. Of course it's not an EPA. Uh, you know, you understand that all now. They are really activities. They should not be skills. So in the title of an EPA, words about skill is not, doesn't, doesn't make sense. Uh, EPA should not be uh, inseparable from, from other EPAs. Uh, so if actually you'd say there's a tiny 
activity, but it's basically always part of a larger activity, though the larger activity will be the EPA, not the tiny one. So uh, EPA should be suitable for entrustment decisions, as actually I said already, and should focus on the end level of training. Well, I'll give some examples of, uh, of, of EPAs and, and frameworks that have been used. Here's a, an example of a, from a project that we did, uh, one of the er earlier uh, projects in the Netherlands. If we advised the physician assistant training, which was a very new specialty or very new uh, healthcare profession in the Netherlands. And uh, it is all very individualized, so uh, they have very, very big different backgrounds when they start the training. And here's fi a five EPA cur workplace curriculum for one individual who will be working in the neurology field. And you can see those EPAs mapped out over time and when they are ready to actually enact those EPAs on, on the level that they're expected to do. And for that specialty, EPAs would, were very helpful to be used because they, people are hired afterwards in that same location. Um, the experiences with that program have uh, actually shown that, uh, and, and, and actually I, I've been in touch with them recently to go back and see what have you done in the past seven years that you've used that. Um, uh, and so it is a, is a two and a half year course. Uh, trainees, those physician assistants come with a background in healthcare. They are uh, highly individualist curricula. So every physician assistant has a different profile when they graduate, a very different profile sometimes. So they cannot transfer to another discipline. They will have to relearn new things really. Uh, the number of EPAs that, uh, that they start out with were, be were actually between five and seven. On average, there were 6.7 EPAs for all those individuals that have been trained in the past years. Um, and actually, at graduation, it's interesting to see that on average, there were slightly uh, fewer EPAs that they were graduated with. And that was because they're, they were flexible during their training with EPAs. In most cases, there were the same number of EPAs. In some cases, there would be one less, but at the time of graduation, they, were, they had a different set of EPAs than initially planned. Um, the number of EPAs on average that was replaced during training because of their, their, uh, the, the nature of their training, there was actually one EPA on, on about six or seven that were replaced. Um, uh, but overall, they had a very, um, we had still, after so many years, uh, still very highly uh, positive reactions. And I just, as I said, I really, I recently got in touch with them again, and they were still very excited on the same concepts, and they had not changed that concept from the very beginning. And now the model is spreading to all across the nation uh, in the Netherlands for uh, physician assistant training. Uh, here's a proposal for pediatric EPAs. You can't read that all, but it actually says there's a list of EPAs. It's from an academic medicine uh, publication of already five years ago. And what you can see there is they map to the three years with the same numbers of supervision levels, and they also map to the, uh, the uh, framework of ACGME competencies here. Um, here is an example from uh, my medical school who will start using EPAs in undergraduate education in a, in a new curriculum that will start next year. And we have been working about a year and a half to think about to identify the APAs for undergraduate education uh, before people go to residency training. And we started out with about 13 to 15 EPAs using a framework that was designed in the United States that was spread around to all, to all medical schools. And we ended up after negotiations with many people with only five EPAs, five broad EPAs, the clinical consultation, general medical procedures, informing and advising patients and their families, communicating, collaborating with colleagues and extraordinary patient care. And on the right column, you see the, uh, the specification of those EPAs what exactly we mean with those, with those titles. Um, and there's only five EPAs, but we build them over time in our curriculum. And if you look at our curriculum, you can't read this either, 
But here you see the EPAs with their description, specification, and limitations. Um, here is the bachelor year three, the master year one, uh, master year two, and master year three. And here's where we want to certify all medical students for graduation. Now, if you think the, the one example, the clinical consultation, we will uh, focus on gynecology, pediatrics, neurology, psychiatry, geriatrics, ophthalmology, dermatology, family medicine, internal medicine, surgery at different stages in undergraduate uh, training. So that, and we actually integrate all those skills and and, and knowledge and um, clinical reasoning that is required in those, uh, I would say, small parts of that large EPA at the end of medical school. So give you a uh, quick impression of what the, the way we are developing our EPAs for undergraduate education. Now, if you think of, of um, not a time-based but a competency-based program, people must get their head around how do we actually accommodate a, 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 a non-time-based program. That's not a very easy to think of it. But basically, there's two ways to go. One way is really varying in the time of training. And you can do that also in, in postgraduate training. Uh, in, in, in my country, uh, and I think that probably here is too, uh, there is some sort of flexibility always because there, there is need to accommodate maternity leaves. Uh, there are some people that do MD, PhD programs that are different, and so you could vary a little bit in the time. But you could also alternatively vary in the breadth of your portfolio of EPAs. You could say you can graduate with the core EPAs that are important for all the people in your specialty, but you could also add elective EPAs that bring people, uh, have, uh, get them a, uh, a, a broader breadth of, of uh, qualities that they have when they graduate. So here are some examples, again, from our uh, undergraduate school. We have those five core EPAs that will be important for all who graduate uh, before the MD degree. But in our sixth year, we have accommodation with electives uh, that people would be able to add to those five core EPAs. Uh, there's one program now that is um, geared to those people who are interested in the domain of, of uh, vital functions, what we call that. That could be anesthesiology, cardiology, pulmonary and critical care, and emergency medicine. If they would in be interested to go in a residency in that direction, we offer them a program that they can have actually three additional EPAs in the last year. We prepare them to do that. And if they do that and they go into a residency that aligns with those EPAs, they could have a residency that's half a year shorter uh, than, than the regular time. So that's one example. Uh, here's another example from the radiology residency program that recently moved to uh, an EPA-based program, uh, and they graduate radiologists with focus areas of, of interest. And it could be a, a, a one focus area or two focus area. You could see that as a sort of subspecialty that is incorporated within their regular training. So the minimum would be that they just have all those core radiology EPAs, and they would work in settings that they have other radiology colleagues who have those specialties that are needed, but they could probably do 80% of the work. Uh, but if they are skillful and are good learners, they might have one or two or three subspecialty areas that they have EPAs in too. And finally, maintenance of competence. So EPAs gained during specialty training may well serve for maintenance of a competence. And if there's continued deliberate practice of EPAs, they may suffice to maintain their portfolio over time. But if uh, practice is disrupted or EPAs are, are not maintained for years, uh, people might have to lose that level four uh, permission to act unsupervised. And there might be renewed supervision mandatory. Um, and when I talk with experience, again, those uh, anesthetists are, who I have a, very often a dialogue with, and they would not be, um, they would actually say, I, I will never do that procedure now because I haven't done that for five years. It's, I don't, 
Uh, people should not be able to trust me, and I wouldn't do that. But basically, they're licensed to do it, and it's just, it just depends a little on their, on their personal morale uh, whether they do that or not. But it would not be unlogical to say, after so many years of, of, of uh, non-practice, non you should actually lose that certification to do that unsupervised. But also, new EPAs may be added to your portfolio. So actually, if you look at that way, your portfolio of EPAs could be a, a, a dynamic reflection of what your actual competence at a certain point. And again, you've seen this, this, uh, this graph. It, it, when you fall below that level of, of the threshold level of trust, you could lose that trust. And here is an example uh, published in uh, Academic Medicine a, a, few num a few years ago, actually when we only started with thinking about those, publishing about EPAs. Here was one said that maybe you could have a, a digital badge that people could access. And here's a digital badge for an EPA in pep smear. And what they also added here was the idea of an expiry date. Here's an expiry date for that. If you don't practice, uh, you lose that permission to act. To, so to wrap up, competency-based medical education is a great advance. Um, and operationalizing uh, competencies for teaching and assessment can be problematic now. So untrustable professional activities have, have, have the, can serve to revitalize uh, competency-based medical education by connecting competencies to practice. Um, and EPAs can serve to create the flexibility in the programs that competency-based medical education actually requires. And trustment decisions can deepen the nature of workplace-based uh, assessment if you really think of it as the patients being involved in your entrustment decision. It's different than only evaluating a learner. Uh, and then EPAs may serve to uh, make maintenance of certification more meaningful. And if we think of it that way, uh, we can even move from competency-based medical education to competency-based medical practice. Thank you for your attention.